take all of you initially and to ask our Lord and Savior for his blessing during this event. You can bow your head with me as we have our opening prayer. Our Father, we are thankful to be able to call you our Father because of what Jesus has done. We thank you for this occasion. We thank you for these men for every accomplishment that they have performed and that we are able to share the joy of that accomplishment with them. We thank you for your presence in this ministry from its very beginning. We pray that those of us who are participating will continue to invoke your blessing day by day. We pray for this each of these men, as they have reached this accomplishment, and we pray that their blessings will continue as they live each day, seeking to understand better what your will is. Thank you for again for loving us and for this occasion. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.
good evening and well, is Sister Moon here today? I would like to ask you to stand on Sister Moon. Um, my mother um, has been one who took me to school every day. I had a perfect attendance in elementary school and middle school and high school and Sunday school and Bible studies and devotions. At some point, you kind of make your own choices and you may go down a dark uh, road. But we do know the Lord. Thank you, Sister Moon. <laughs> the Lord led me to the House of Disciples and I thank Him. The House of Disciples has provided me food when I was hungry, clothing when I was, didn't have clothes, and shelter when I had no home, didn't have any home. I was in. Uh, <laughs> Yes, all right. Their purpose was to fulfill. Uh, let me regroup. Their purpose was to fulfill Isaiah, Isaiah 15 and Matthew 25 by making me a disciple who knew Christ, who shared Christ, and multiplied Christ in the life of others. And Tim, I thank you for that. You have definitely done that. They helped me with um, life controlling problems by drug addiction, by making me a, a follower of Jesus instead. Family and friends have been, family and friendships have been restored. Bible studies, devotions, small groups, worship, um, worship times have assisted me as transforming my life, have assisted transforming my life. HOD gave assistance to becoming able, gave assistance to me becoming emotionally stable, physically well, socially adjusted, and just all around follower of Jesus. They made me a servant leader, and I understand clearly now that the strength that the Lord gives me is not just for myself, but it's for others as well. Yes. Jesus walked beside 12 men. Thank you, HOD, for the patience it took to make me a disciple. <laughs> the House of Disciples has changed my life tremendously by a closer relationship with the man above God. 1 Corinthians 15, 15 and 57. 1 Corinthians 15 and 57. But thanks be to God which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> the grace of God has always been with me in the house of disciples. He brought me up out of the horrible clay, out of the horrible pit, but God. He brought me up out of the miry clay, but God. He set my feet on solid rock, but God. He established my goings, but God. My addiction of cocaine and various drugs set me down a path and where the devil had control over me, but God called me to be free and to serve one another in love. In order to free others, then you should be free yourself. Glory to God. Serving their time. 
After a couple of years and several dozen ministry trips into the prison, the band began praying about what more we could do. Over the few years of being inside, some men would connect with us once they were released. And most of them had some sort of re-entry plan, but occasionally we would hear or see an offender back in prison for a parole violation. In late summer of 2014, the House of Disciples was invited by the TDCJ director, uh, the director of chaplaincy and the chaplain from the Billy Moore unit, to introduce the HOD Discipleship Program and to oversee the 84-man restorative justice pod at the Billy Moore Correctional Facility. With weekly classes led by Wiseman ministry staff and community volunteers, these men will complete the year-long HOD discipleship program. Tonight, we want to introduce to you the first class of 32 men who have not only completed the HOD curriculum, but have committed to enter our new, newly formed transitional phase known as Reality Scenario. In this phase, the men are placed into small groups of six and begin developing their re-entry plan. With men like Gabriel Fuentes, a friend of mine who just completed the program but also uh, re-entered back into society, he was released on his mom's birthday in March, now resides in Dallas, Texas, where he works a full-time job as well as works a part-time job with a family business doing roofing. We talk minimum of once a week via phone or Facebook. See, the truth is, I don't think any of us in the band or in the ministry had the desire to go into prison. But I do know this, all of us have the desire to see people free. Free from addiction. Free from oppression. Free from bondage. The result? Free people. Free people. <laughs> So one more time, can we just give them a hand for it? She actually says that whom God will use greatly, he will first wound deeply. And a heart for people who are in prison and who are broken comes from a heart, myself and others on staff who have experienced loved ones who are in prison. I have a brother that served in the 55 your sentence for assault and that before I didn't have a heart um, for those that are in prison until my brother went. And then all of a sudden I, I couldn't do I couldn't do enough. I wanted to experience all I could to go in and help those that were in need. So it, it took brokenness. I just as free people free people, broken people also reach out and help other broken people. And so we thank God and we embrace our brokenness so that we can take that, utilize it. To reach other people and make disciples of men as God has called us to do. It's my honor and privilege tonight to introduce to you our, our speaker. And Michael Bell is a, first of all, he's a dear friend. Somebody who I definitely have looked up to and somebody who's reached out and has mentored and, and uh, has done some tremendous things in my life personally, but also um, and within our ministry at House of Disciples. He's really the instrument that God used to open up the door to get us consistently working in prisons and servicing, uh, providing services and music and some different things like that. And, and uh, he's just an incredible guy. Everything he'll say tonight, I don't know what he's going to say, but I promise you, everything he says tonight is the life that he lives outside of here. Uh, he is a tremendous role model for anybody and a tremendous mentor for anybody that would meet him. So without any further ado, he's going to come and visit with you for just a minute. Uh, you guys please welcome Michael Bell. Incarcerated. And after working there, 
is I even sit back and look and I said, wow, uh, I'm very fortunate. I, I applied for the work for the Department of uh, Corrections back then in 1983. I was 18 years of age. Uh, I had just graduated. And even though I'm from Henderson, was born and raised in Henderson, went to school in Henderson all my life. It was my last semester of my senior year. I graduated from Spring Hill here in Longview, Texas. Is, but I got accepted and, and got to go to work for the Department of um, Corrections. And of course, we had 18 years of age. Is, you know, I sit back and look, and we shouldn't hire 18 year olds to go to work in prison. And I look back and I just sit here and shake my head. But over the course of um, my career, is I've been very blessed. And I've been a Christian for most of my life. I was about 10 years old when I accepted Christ. And I, I can remember to this day of sitting in church and it's an evening service. And you know, sometimes evening services are kind of short. There's not a a lot of people there sometimes, and I just remember that I was convicted to uh, accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And but looking back over that over my year, a lot of the years is that I practice that, that I have my relationship with that, and I did it. Is you know I like to um, thank the House of the South for inviting me. It was when they invited me is. I've had a good relationship with him over the years, and, and when he talks about coming into the prison and coming into uh, the facility over in Henderson, East Texas treatment facility, there's 2,236 beds. It's made up of men and women, 336 women. It's made up of probationers, parolees, and regular institution offenders. And I can remember, as he talked about Pastor Josh, who's the chaplain there, is coming to me about um, white chocolate. And I heard that name, I just shook my head. So what's this? <laughs> and, uh, and, and I said, sure. And I can remember them starting to come into the facility. And I just seen them dragging all this equipment. And he told me, he said, well, you know, they're probably going to do this um, every month. And then we got into every month, and then we said, we're going to do a service for the males and a service for the females, because we couldn't put them together for some reason or another. <laughs> and, and I tell you what, when he talks about that I've helped him in his life, he's helped me in my life in the house of the South. To see that commitment, and then coming in and willing to come in to help others. And I call it today, I call it hope. Helping other people every day is, and that's really what it is it's about. And as, as I listened, listened to the graduate, and he talked about one of the key things I heard him say was sharing Jesus. And I can remember being a Christian, and I was scared to share Jesus. I was scared what somebody would think, and I'm embarrassed to sit here and say that. But the reality is the truth. Is has anybody else been had fear? And I say not embarrassed, but fearful. Has anybody had any fear in their life but sharing Jesus? <laughs> and you're honest, and that, that's, is, but I want to sit here and say uh, today is and, and with the graduates is when I went to work for the prison. In my view back then, is I needed a job. The economy was bad. I wasn't ready to go to school is and so I went to work at the prison system. I actually got into it and I enjoyed it. Is but it was a lot different in 1983 uh, than it is today. And we actually when I started there, we had no female staff that worked in the back with the inmates besides the teachers. And, but as far as correctional staff or anything like that, that didn't happen. Because, and that come about a couple years later, and we used to, to, to have the prisoner and, and the inmates uh, were actually, you know, assisted staff in maintaining order because we'd be running a 2,000 bed facility 
was about 12 or 13 staff people. Is I mean, when I sit back and look at that, I say, wow. And, and today it, it, it's grown and, and, and change has happened and it's needed to happen. But the biggest change in my career that I see is volunteers. Is the prison system in my early career was not real open in my opinion to allow volunteers to come into the prison. Does anybody in here volunteer in prisons today? Several of you. Is back then there wasn't a lot of volunteers. Over the years and, and for a number of years now, you know, they have allowed volunteers to come in from the community. And I can remember working there and I said, oh my Lord, this is going to be trouble. And but my spiritual faith was, even though I'm a Christian, and I believe in God, and I believe in Jesus, again, I didn't necessarily practice it. But what's happened since then is, in the last several years, the state of Texas has shut down three different prisons. And I give credit to volunteers coming into that prison. Is before, they were just building prisons. Building prisons. When I started uh, working there, I want to say we had 28, 29 prisons in the state of Texas. And that's with the Department of Corrections, Department of Criminal Justice. And today we have about 109 in the state of Texas, not counting county jails, not counting federal. Is, and they just built and built in the 80s and the 90s. And so to sit here and say over the last five, six years, seven years, if we've been able to shut down three prisons because of decrease in population, I give him the credit. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I worked when I started for the Department of Criminal, you know, Department of Corrections and the Department of Criminal Justice to change their name, where it become parole, probation, parole. Is, and then in 1995, I actually uh, left the department and went to work for a company called Management Training Corporation. As illustrated up here, we operate the Billy Moore Correctional Facility in Overton, Texas. It's one of uh, about 14 different contracts that we have with the Department of Criminal Justice. And fortunately, I believe that we have a, the state of Texas it's truly trying to change what's happening in our prison system. And I see it. And I will tell you that the people on the inside, I, I, was, at, I was there today at one of the prisons. And we started a new program. And they're just seeking it. And as volunteers, you see that when you go in there. House of the South will see that. And that, uh, like we say, listen, is, it motivates you to help. And, and what I will tell you that I'm fortunate to work for a company that, yes, we're, we're a private company, is we're not a nonprofit organization, is, but we operate facilities across the United States. We also operate job corps centers, uh, which help disadvantaged youth across the United States. We also operate the whole probation system in the UK, in London, uh, not the whole UK, but London and, and then Thane, is we also work with training people for careers and jobs, so the, 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 what we're doing here is not a faith base, but it's still hope, helping other people every day, is we have a, um, one of our divisions is uh, economic uh, and development. And we've actually worked in Iraq, Haiti, um, we're currently in Egypt, is uh, Tunisia. And we're actually going to those countries trying to help train people where they can actually be productive uh, citizens, give them the skills that they need. But what I want to tell the graduates tonight is, your experience and what 
you've had the opportunity to participate in over here is one, nobody can take this graduation away from you. Is but what you do with it is up to you. Somebody gave me an opportunity and what I did with it again was up to me. And that's everybody in this room. And I made mistakes. I made mistakes my whole life. I still make mistakes. But we can overcome them. You just gotta believe. And, and, and to me that belief is having Jesus Christ at the center. And so when we talk about volunteers, is I talk to the community people that are here that we need volunteers. We need volunteers inside. We need volunteers on the outside. Think of that individual that goes in and gets locked up and you get on different kinds of crimes. I will be the first one to tell you that people that commit serious, violent act crime is if they need to be incarcerated, they need to be incarcerated. And I don't think too many people disagree with that. But we've got to make sure we have a fair system. Is but we also got to remember we can't lock up everybody. And how many of you are employing people for your jobs? How many of you need help? How many of you are hard to find help? Is and it is, uh, and, and that's in my our profession. And that's in my profession. And when I talk about the basic needs, you think about an individual coming out, and just like here in, in, in the House of Disciples, going into this prison here and offering, and then when they get out, opening their doors, that's incredible. So what they're doing on the inside and helping change lives, and then to be able to transition and re-entry into society, is most people want to give up. I will ask you to raise your hand. Has anybody ever given up on you? Have you ever made mistakes? And, wow, they're just kind of done with you? Has anybody ever had a second chance? Yes. And that, that's what I want to instill. It's because of, we all deserve a second chance. But our society is so many times against giving second chances. Is you know, once you have that label that you've been locked up, it, it, it is it is difficult. And I can I can even start to understand. It. And talking to individuals every day and every week, I do understand. But it takes a community to come and help. And if that community does not get involved, is it's going to lead to further issues. And we see that in our country right now is you know, just like transportation. What happens many times they're set up and they're required to do certain classes, uh, not need their driver's license, is they, let's just sit here and say that, uh, I'll use Wado, Texas. They live in Wado, Texas. But they have to take a class uh, to get the certificate to get the driver's license. How do they get over here to Longview where they might have that class? And if it's not, if they don't have family and they don't have friends, it comes back on the community. And because in order for them to really go to work, they gotta have transportation. They gotta have food. They gotta have clothes. A lot of them have families when they get out. But so many of them don't. And and so many times in, in Bridging we sometimes encourage not necessarily to go back to the family because it could cause you to come right back. And so I plead to you that, you know, if anything that, that I can say is in my experience and what I've learned and witnessed and seen is that I'm a true believer that individuals in incarceration need a second chance. And I believe that by opening up volunteers coming into prison, it's a start, okay? But if we don't transition them back in the community where they can continue that uh, classes, whether it's faith-based, uh, whether it's skill set, 
is if we don't continue that, they're going to end up dropping back into the system. I don't have the exact numbers, but there's data. I was in a, um, in a group with uh, state officials, but we also had the Minister of um, the Criminal Justice in the UK here in Texas. And the article that I read was the UK goes to Texas to look for ideals and to take back to the UK, which a lot of people look at Texas pretty hard on crime, is that the minister actually went and toured several facilities and he looked at the programs, not all faith-based, is but looked at programs and trying to take them back uh, in the UK. And that's where I say, well, what's happening in the state of Texas? There's some good things happening. But it takes people, it takes work. I sit here and think about the volunteers. They show up and then they have a lockdown. <coughs> Nobody called them. And it's sometimes a very faithless job. And, and I, I, when I look at the House of Disciples and them coming in, is I, I, did I really think that they were going to be committed to coming in every month? And every month I looked out my window and I could see the parking lot. And I, See their caravan pulling up, and I see them pulling in all of this, and they shook my heads, and, and then they had to go through searches to get there. And, you know, and I, I fell for it. But I tell you, personally, it affected me. I said, wow, you know what somebody gives me or forgot? Is, and y'all got to share that experience. Is, um, so before I close, is I want to one, thank the House of Disciples for making a difference in every one of your lives and other people's lives across the state of Texas. And I think we should give them a round of applause. But to the graduates, I will tell you that don't give up is so many times where I see people come back, one thing that helped you in this program, and again, this is my personal belief, that you got a spiritual foundation, and you, you understand. How I many of you fully understood when you started the program? That's good. Yes. How many of you ready to quit the program in 30 days? <laughs> Anybody ever hear it make a difference in your life? Is pretty cool. And just like everybody in here can make a difference in somebody else's life. But we get so committed to our business, and sometimes you can overcommit. But don't be scared to help the folks that truly need it. So I can remember my first Celebrate Recovery meeting. And I went in to bring Celebrate Recovery. Uh, into the prison and actually into our community. And I went to Marlboro, right there in Longview, Texas. And I'll tell you what helped me when I went in there was one, it wasn't about me, it wasn't for me, I didn't have any issues. <laughs> and, but probably within 60 minutes of being there, the so, whoo, they talking to me tonight. <laughs> but I tell you how the unintended consequences are of going to that church who also celebrate recovery right there in this community. Some of you might be familiar with celebrate recovery, some of you might not, but it's faith based. Is walking out of there. We actually did start celebrating recovery inside in the prison. And that's been about six years ago or seven years ago. Today, we have celebrated recovery in several of our different facilities across the state. But right over there in Henderson, because of what's happened right here in Longview, Texas, in Mobley, in other churches that attended their celebrated recovery here in Great County is 
Every week we have 3,400 participants in the <coughs> Celebrate Recovery class of one Thursday night in Henderson. Thursday night, I think that Billy Moore, we just got it started about six months ago, is we had, it's only a 500 bank facility, is we had about 10% of the population there. Is that's big. And the only reason that at East Texas with that facility is the largest place that I have that can hold room is 300 people. Is so if that 300 people was 500 people, I believe I'd have 500 people in there. <coughs> but it takes volunteers. And, and how I met them was when I started going visiting churches about Celebrate Recovery and talking to volunteers. I found somebody who was volunteering to Celebrate Recovery in Tyler, Texas, in Green Acres, that I met. I told them what I was doing. And her passion and her calling was to help celebrate recovery starting in prison, but she couldn't get the opportunity. I said, come on. And she's been with me ever since. And she's built the program. She's helped me uh, build more. Is, and so faith-based, I mean, personally, I, I got to stay in it because I'm spiritually. Of course, you know, with faith and government and everything else and private companies, is it's just fortunately that's why I'm glad that I'm spiritually grounded, understand uh, where I get my balance at, and um, I'm very thankful for that. I'll share one other thing that, you know, it's of course I've told you I've made mistakes, I've been through divorce, and I remarried. So I have my wife here over here. She's in the right now. Her name's Debbie. But Debbie used to be the warden of Billy Moore when this program started. She was a warden over there for about five or six years. She retired 18 months ago. And uh, so when I seen those pictures coming across and you start talking about it starting in 2014, and she didn't have a clue that that was going to be on the video, I seen tears over there, you know, coming through her, her eyes. And I'm just thankful that the volunteers in the state of Texas, in our communities, are coming in for At the same time, I just ask you to, when they get out, be ready to receive them. In churches, and of course, people go to churches, and people that go to churches operate businesses, work in businesses, and it's just a network. And don't be scared of the network just because somebody's a friend. Right, man. Right, man. So in closing, doing for others is doing for Christ. Matthew 25, 35 through 40. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison and he came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer, Truly I say to you, as you did to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to your friend. That's the best way I can close out. And God bless all of you. Thank you.